Hello again. Um, first off, I'd like to apologize if I seem winded at all because my breathing issues have been acting up a little, have been acting up today, so I have been a little bit winded, so I do apologize if I have to stop and catch my breath after speaking for a bit. So, to, it's been one year since my sex reassignment surgery. I had my surgery on December 12th of 2017, so I wanted to go ahead and talk about that and talk about, you know, how things have been over the course of a year and how I feel about things now and all of that. And so I wanted to go ahead and do this video today because it is the one year anniversary. So let us get on with that. So <clears throat> my surgery was done through Kaiser, which is Kaiser Northern California, <clears throat> which is an HMO. It's an insurance company that has its own medical facilities and so you go to their own doctors and everything you know with with some outside people you go to for certain things and so <clears throat> apologies so given the kaiser plan that i was on my 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 options for surgeons were basically just their own in-house guy and <clears throat> And Kaiser has like amazing trans benefits. So with the plan that I was on, like they paid for, they completely covered the surgery and my hospital stay. So that cost me nothing. And my surgery was done by Dr. Ali Salim, who was assisted by the urologist, Dr. Carl Thomas. And that was done at the uh, Kaiser Hospital in San Francisco. And one of the things that Kaiser does that I think is really cool is before you get the surgery, you have to attend a, um, a surgery class. And at this class, you know, you've got the surgeon there, you know, you've got Dr. Salim was there talking about the surgery. And I took actually the class twice. And the second time I took it, he actually showed us video uh, pictures of surgery results. And so that was really cool. And then there's like a social worker there talking about, you know, like aftercare stuff and and all of this. And then there's like a nurse there talking about stuff. And there's a, you know, like a therapist there talking about mental health stuff. So that was really cool. And so prior to getting the surgery, I had to get my weight down. And the reason you have to get your weight down is because um, you have this like this pad of fat in your crotch area and so if you have too much fat there that'll impact the depth of the vagina not only not only that of course the fact that surgery is more risky on people who are more um, overweight so I managed to do that thankfully but sadly I've gained a bunch of the weight back but it's going back in the right direction and also I had to go off estrogen before the surgery and that is due to um, issues with blood clots. Now, initially, I was supposed to go off estrogen for a week, uh, for a month, which I was not too keen on that idea. So I talked to Dr. Salim, and he said that uh, I would be able to do it just for two weeks. So I was off estrogen for two weeks, and that was not fun. You know, I ended up having hot flashes because you're still taking the testosterone blocker, so. I had pretty much, I had no estrogen in my system and I had really low testosterone levels, so yeah. The other thing you do prior to the surgery is a couple of days before you start a bowel cleanse. And they do this because of the area that they're working in in case there's a, a fistula, which would be like an opening between the vagina and the rectum, just to avoid any bacterial contamination. So you go on a liquid diet which basically I lived uh, for a couple of days. I lived off of it has to be you have to live off of like clear liquids and you can have jello, but I didn't because jello is not vegan. And um, <clears throat> you can have coffee, I did have that. So basically, I just lived off of like Gatorade, apple juice, vegan beef broth, and coffee. Coffee was Splenda because I was allowed to have some Splenda in my coffee but no soy milk. <clears throat> so, yeah. 
And you also um, drink this stuff called um, gavelite, which is this bowel cleansing stuff. And I'm going to be posting, I took a bunch of pictures of all of this and, you know, pictures at the hospital and everything, which I will be posting on my Instagram. And so if, you know, which will, my link to that will be in the video description. So I've got a picture showing the gavel light and I've actually got a little video of me drinking it and <clears throat> reacting to it. So I will be probably posting that video on Instagram as well. I've got a number of sh little short videos I shot at various points. So I'll probably be posting those on Instagram so you can check those out. <clears throat> so the gavel light comes in this like big, like it's like a four liter jug. And so it's like this powder that's in there and then you have this little flavor packet you dump in there and you fill it up with water and stir it up. And the stuff is pretty gross. It's, it's got this sort of viscous texture that's just nasty and you just have to you drink half of it the first day and then half of it the second day. And then you basically just spend your life on the toilet because it just completely cleans you out. It gives you mad diarrhea to completely flush out your bowels. <clears throat> so that sucked. And <clears throat> apologies. So we had to be at the hospital at 6 in the morning. So we had to get up at the, at the wee hours of the morning to get to the hospital. And... I lived in the Bay Area, in the East Bay, so it wasn't too terribly far to get there. <coughs> oh, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm all fucking phlegmy. Um, so yeah, my parents were kind enough to drive me to the hospital, and it's, it's very cool that, you know, my mom and dad were supportive enough that they actually went with me. So we get there, <coughs> get there on time at 6 a.m. and check in and everything. And one of the things that they did at the Kaiser in San Francisco that was really cool is <clears throat> every patient is given a code number that, like, the friends and family get. And then you can look up on this board and you can see the code numbers and see the status of the patient, which I think is a clever idea. So that way people aren't constantly bugging the receptionist. Hey, what's going on with my, with my dad and his heart surgery or whatever it is, right? <clears throat> Another thing they did, due to lack of cell phone coverage, they get they had this little thingy, little gadget that they that they gave to my parents so they can actually like if they needed to get a, a hold of them they can do that. So so yeah, we were in the waiting room for a little while and then they call us in, and of course I had to take off all my clothes and get into the hospital gown and they made me take out all of my jewelry. And initially, I was I thought the issue was just metal, so I did end up getting some glass jewelry for my, um, and I figured, you know, my the stuff I normally have in my ears is silicone, so I thought that would be okay, but nope, I had to take all of it out. And my septum, I'd gotten that done, like, not that long before. I think it had been maybe six weeks. So it, you know, so it was pretty freshly healed at that point. And... So I had to take that all out, and then fun. And then the fun began when they did the IV. If you've ever had an IV, you know how fun those are. I fucking hate IVs. So the guy, the nurse, goes to do the IV on my right hand side, and he tries it three different times and fucks it up every time. Ugh, and it's terrible. So then he calls in somebody else to come do it, and so it's done on my left hand side, and finally the person gets it. Thank the Lord. Yeah. Having to get stuck with the IV four times, no thank you. So that once that's done, and then the anesthesiologist came in to talk to me. Initially, I had received an email from the anesthesiologist saying, hey, I'm going to be your anesthesiologist and whatever. And it turns out that she wasn't going to be available to do it. So she actually came in to say, to say hey, I'm not going to be able to do your anesthesia. Somebody else is going to do it. So that was cool that she did that. So, yeah, so then I, of course, get wheeled in for surgery, and the surgery lasted for eight hours. It was a long one, <clears throat> and I was under for about ten hours. And so, <clears throat> yeah, that's surgery, that surgery is, is 
is no joke. It's a very serious surgery, and I spent uh, a week in the hospital. So yeah, that surgery is absolutely no joke. <clears throat> this is definitely not something you just want to do on a whim. And this is something, a surgery that I've wanted for, I think, around 20 years or something. Like, I've wanted this for decades. And when, when I found out that Kaiser covered it, I immediately jumped on it because I had wanted this for so long. And at one point, I decided against getting it, but only because I figured there's no way I'd ever be able to afford it. So there's no point in wanting something I can never have. So when I found out that I was going to be able to get it, it was like a, uh, a shattered dream was restored. It was awesome. So yeah, so I got, so yeah, I spent a week in the hospital. And as you can imagine, there's plenty of pain involved. So they had me hooked up to a, uh, to a pain pump. A pain pump with uh, Dilaudid, which is hydromorphone, I think, is the medication. And so... The way the pain pump works is you have a little button you push that gives you a hit of the medication. And then they set it so it gives you a certain amount each time you push the button and you can only push the button a certain amount of times within a given time period. <clears throat> but what's cool is, is every time you push the button it makes note of that. So if it's no longer giving you medication but you're still pushing the button, it'll make note of that. That way... Um, the nurse can see, oh, you push the button a whole lot. Maybe we need to up your dosage. So that was cool. But thankfully, the dosage they gave me was fine. I have a pretty good pain tolerance. So the amount they gave me was pretty good. And one of the things that's really important when you're dealing with a serious surgery like this, do not wait until you're, you're in pain. You want to hit the button at a reasonable interval to avoid being in pain to begin with. You know, you don't want to wait until you're in pain and then have to wait for the drug to kick in to stop the pain. Just, you know, hit it at a, at a reasonable interval so you don't have to deal with the pain. <clears throat> and so, um, initially, my, they, they put, um, my vagina was packed with gauze and the labia were sewn shut to keep everything in and then I had a catheter so I could pee and a couple of drains you know to drain to drain out the blood and so somebody would have to come in and and you know um, empty out the the catheter bag and empty out the drains and initially since I was just stuck in bed they initially had these things on my legs that would inflate in order to uh, prevent blood clots <clears throat> eventually they ended up um, they ended up taking those off and then they actually made me get up and walk, which you know is is definitely not fun when I mean when you've had a serious rearranging of your genitalia like that, um yeah, that's definitely walking is definitely not the most comfortable thing to be doing, but you gotta do it <clears throat> and eventually. You know, eventually I also was able to, to take a shower. And so I still had to deal with, like, the catheter bag. I think, let me think, I think by the time I was able to take a shower, I think they'd already taken the drains out. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Because at one point after a certain amount of days, nurse came in to uh, undo the sutures that were holding the labia closed, and he pulled out all of the, uh, the gauze. And... It reminded me of that magician's trick where they pull out that continuous scarf because, I mean, it was just like the gauze just kept coming and coming and coming. And then, <clears throat> and then I was shown how to dilate. And so to dilate, you use, they give you these, this set of these dilators that I've got here. I'll show them to you. These are made by Soul Source, and these are, these are meant for sex reassignment surgery patients. They're basically just like hard plastic, I guess they're plastic, they're hard plastic dildos that you insert into the vagina <clears throat> to stretch it out because the vagina wants to close itself up. And they have these dots on them, I don't know if you can see that, but they have these dots so you can actually measure the depth. So, you know, you push it in a certain, you know, I push it in a certain amount and then Basically, the nurse said that I'm supposed to go up to whatever dot it is. 
And initially, I had to dilate um, four times a day. And, you know, and then you do the, the, and then you just move up in sizes. Here's the next size. And then here's, you know, the, the next biggest one. And then the last one, this orange one, is the biggest, which is uh, optional. And I actually did manage to get that one in at one point. So, so yeah, so you, initially you got to dilate four times a day and, and I had to, <clears throat> and like I said, I had to start dilating in the hospital. I think, I think the first day that I dilated, I was actually dilating five times instead of four. But then, you know, at home, once I got home, it was four times a day for a while. <clears throat> and, uh. Yeah, and then once all the packing had come out and the drains had come out, then I was able to take a shower, but I still had the catheter in, so I had to, I was like in the shower with the catheter bag hanging outside the shower. It was kind of funky. And so, yeah, in the hospital, I was just spending a lot of time in bed, and I had a TV, and I had this little sort of remote thing that was attached to the bed. I had, with a, you know, I had a plug that was, I guess, plugged into the bed. And it was actually kind of cool because not only did it control the TV, but it had a speaker on it so you could hear the TV, and it had a headphone jack, and it had a, the buttons to control a couple of the lights, and it had the nurse call button, and you could actually talk to the nurse through the speaker, which was cool. I also had my cell phone, so I spent a lot of time just going on Twitter and chatting with people. And one of them, a little tip, Make sure that you have a really long USB cable for your for your phone to charge it. <clears throat> Cause I did not. So my from where the outlet was, the cable would not reach all the way to the bed. So I'd have to ask the nurse to plug my phone in for me. And I'd have to leave <clears throat> leave it there to charge. And then I'd have to call the nurse again, hey, could you get my phone? So I ended up asking my mom to um to get me the uh, my USB extension cable from home, and once I got that, I was able to have you know have plug in my phone whenever I needed to. And a little tip: you want to have your cable wrapped around the bed rail so you don't drop it. So yeah, I spent a lot of time on Twitter, and the uh, the surgery was done the day before my birthday. So I spent the my birthday, December thirteenth, in the hospital. <coughs> And a couple of cool things is my mom came to visit me. My mom and dad came to visit me for my birthday. And um, at Whole Foods, they have a vegan chocolate cake that I had for my birthday one year. And they also have it in like mini form. So my mom brought a couple of the little mini versions of that, of that chocolate cake. So I was able to have vegan chocolate cake for my birthday. That was cool. And another thing that was really cool is one of the nurses saw that it was my birthday and she gave me a birthday card with 20 bucks in it. That was like super nice of her. Like I'm a complete stranger and she just decides to give me 20 bucks and I thought that was really cool. And oh, speaking of food, uh, they do, they, Kaiser does serve vegan food. The food is like these TV dinner sort of things and yeah, frankly, it was not great. That's kind of that's kind of the stereotype of hospital food that is not very good. So, yeah, there was oh there was this green curry that was pretty terrible, and they would have somebody come in, you know, to take your order, and so there was one day when there was something that I ordered that they didn't have, and so they substituted that for the green curry that I absolutely did not like. So it was like ah damn. Yeah, so basically when that green curry came uh, out of the out of the meal I ate like there was like some cookies that were vegan and I think there was like like a roll. So you know, a piece of bread. So I ate that. Um probably the best thing was was the breakfast. Once that all got sorted out, breakfast consisted of Czech cereal with soy milk and a bagel with i can't it was like i think earth balance or smart balance one of those one of those vegan butter substitutes and i also use some of the soy milk in in my coffee so that was actually pretty good yeah i think what what else was there there was like a like a pasta dish that was kind of okay i think there was something with chickpeas 
Yeah, I think the most memorable things were the breakfast and that green curry because, yeah, the worst, the best and the worst. And one of the things that I did that I highly recommend doing is I brought vegan protein bars with me. I brought a bunch of the the um, uh, the Cliff Builders bars and also the Nugo Dark bars. If you've never tried the Nugo Dark bars, they are so good. They're glorified candy bars. They've got 10 grams of protein a piece. They're absolutely delicious. So I didn't lose any weight in the hospital because I had these protein bars to munch on. And so it's a really good idea to bring something to eat that you know you like just in case the hospital food sucks. You know, get... and. You know, and, and like protein bars or energy bars, things of that sort, those are a good option just because they're easy and they're convenient. You just open them up and you eat them and, you know, just find whatever kind you like and bring those. Uh, what else? Yeah, eventually towards the end, you know, the, the catheter was removed and then they, they had me uh, go pee, you know, in the bathroom just to make sure that I could pee properly before sending me home. And so, yeah, after a week, after a week, I, I got sent home. Oh, and one of the things, when initially sitting down is going to be uncomfortable, so the, um, the recommendation was to get one of those inflatable donuts, you know, that they've got like at the, um, <clears throat> at the drugstores. But somebody at the surgery class had a really good idea. Because one of the things they did at that surgery class that was really cool that I forgot to mention is they had, they had some folks there who had gone through the surgery to talk about their experience. And somebody mentioned using a neck pillow because the neck pillow is like open in the front so that's more comfortable to sit on. Great advice. Now the neck pillow I had purchased on Amazon, it was one of those like as memory foam kind of thing so it would just squish down which was not cool, but we happened to have another neck pillow at home that didn't squish down as much. So that's the one that I use. So there's a good tip for you. Ah, oh, what else? Yeah, so uh, the recovery at home, it was just a lot of time spent in bed, as well as, uh, uh, figures. I live near, I live near the uh, fire station, so I get, get them coming by periodically. But yeah, a lot of time in bed, and then of course you have to get up to do some walking just to make sure you don't get blood clots. Then you gotta dilate four times a day. And it's a number of weeks before you're really able to go like really do stuff. I mean, for me being a bike rider, of course it took a little while before I could ride a bike, so I had to, you know, get rides from people. And you know, after after about three months, you're you're reasonably healed up, but you know you're still pretty fucking swollen at that point. It, but it definitely looks a lot better initially. Initially, everything looks looks pretty horrific, and that's one of those things where I've actually got some pictures on my Tumblr that I posted of the uh, surgery results. <clears throat> And I'm actually going to be posting more so you can actually see what it looks like completely healed. But, yeah, and so I'll put a link to that in the video description. And I warn you, it's very graphic. It's nasty. It's incredibly swollen. It looks terrible. And so, you know, and it takes a while. And then after, after six months, um, that's when I was told that I could start having penetrative sex. You know, and you definitely want to follow your surgeon's advice because you don't want to break anything. You don't want to fuck shit up, and you want to be careful with all of that because, you know, you don't want to cause any permanent damage. But after six months, things are pretty well healed, <clears throat> and it takes up to a year to be fully healed. So at this point, I consider myself fully healed. And overall, everything was great. The only real issue that I ran into was a couple of things. One is one of the sutures in my left labia popped out prematurely. So I've got a little sort of a weird kind of a little break in my left labia. But honestly, it's a really minor issue that's just cosmetic. And I could go get a labiaplasty to get it fixed, but it doesn't really bother me. So I'm not going to bother. 
And I really I don't need a designer pussy, you know? I just, it's fine. It looks great. It's just a minor issue, so no point in bothering to get it fixed. The other issue is that I've been really bad about dilating. Initially, I was really good, and I dilated as instructed, but, but then after a while, it just kind of dropped off, and it's been, I've just been really bad about it. So right now, like, last time I dilated was a number of days ago, and I was able to get the purple dilator in, the smallest one. I was able to get that into full depth, which is good, but... Yeah, and so I really need to like get back on track with that because like I mentioned at one point I was able to get the biggest one in and I need to get back to that point. If I ever want to have sex with a penis, like I really got to get to that point so I could properly fit someone's penis in there. Speaking of which, I'm sure people are wondering like, wondering like does it work? Like am I sexually sensitive? And you bet your skippy I'm sexually sensitive. Everything works really well in that respect. Um, masturbation these days is a hell of a lot more enjoyable <clears throat> than it ever was when I had a penis. <clears throat> it's freaking awesome. Um, and I was actually, I started masturbating like, like 11, <clears throat> like 11 days after the surgery, something crazy. I can't remember if it was like 11 days after I got out of the hospital or 11 days after the surgery, but it was surprisingly soon you know I was looking at this picture of this uh, this uh, trans woman that I was chatting online with a picture of her in her undies and bra and it was really really hot so I was getting really horny and I started and I started rubbing myself you know just external stimulation and I almost got to the point of having an orgasm but I stopped myself because I was like wait a minute should I be doing this so I emailed the surgeon and I said hey is it okay if I do this? And he said that that external stimulation that I was doing was fine. <clears throat> so it was not long after that, and not long after that, that I had my first post-op orgasm. So, yeah. And I think one of the things that led to me having an orgasm so soon was the fact that I was a, that I, I masturbated a whole lot pre-op. And, you know, so... I've heard that the ability to orgasm pre-op um, is determines your ability to post-op, uh, to orgasm post-op. So if you can orgasm pre-op, there's a very good chance you'll be able to orgasm post-op. But for those of you who are going to be getting the surgery, don't even stress over it. Don't worry if you're if it takes a while for you to have an orgasm. As far as I can tell, my case is unusual. It might take you a number of months before you have an orgasm, and that's okay, you know? And, yeah, it's kind of funny because, uh, that um, there are folks on Twitter I was chatting online with, these more anti-trans sort of folks who were, like, trying to argue that at some point I'm going to, like, regret having got the surgery. And, well... And, and like every time I have a really good orgasm, I'm thinking, when am I supposed to regret this? Like it's been a year and I'm still really glad I got it done. I'm super happy with it. Dr. Salim did a fantastic job. No complaints. Um, yeah. And oh, it's just aside from like orgasms aside, because that's, because really the orgasms are just icing on the cake. Because even if I could never have another orgasm, I would still be glad I got the surgery. It's just so nice to finally have the right body part. <clears throat> you know, it's just so nice to like... It's nice to be able to like go to the gym. And like go into the locker room and just take my clothes off. And not have to fucking worry about it. And just... Just, you know, live my life like any other woman. It's so nice. It's so nice to pre-op. I never bothered tucking because it was uncomfortable. So I'd have to worry about making sure that I was wearing stuff like pants that were baggy enough that you couldn't see anything. And it's just so nice to be able just to wear whatever the fuck I feel like wearing and not have to concern myself as to whether anyone's going to see a bulge because there's nothing there. So yeah, it's... I'm really, really glad I got it done. Oh... And uh, when you have a surgery of this magnitude, it's not uncommon 
you know, right after the surgery to be thinking, oh shit, what did I get myself into? And so I was expecting that, but I didn't get that at all. <clears throat> I just got like a sense of peace. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I'm sure there was some initial excitement, but, you know, and especially some excitement once I started masturbating, it was like, it was really cool to like, explore all of that and also you know there's also some really groovy sex toys for women and so it's been really cool to play with some of these like toys that are designed for a female anatomy you know like they've got these pressure wave clit stimulators that use like little puffs of air and yeah it's been fun to play with those you know and so but now like the excitement is kind of wore off and now it's just it's my genitals, it's just my life, and I'm, I'm very happy with my genitals, <clears throat> you know, but they're just like, it's just, it's just the genitals I have, and I'm just like, I'm, I guess at this point, I'm just like any other woman, pretty much, you know, so, so yeah, I, the way I feel right now, I mean, I can't imagine that I'm going to wake up one day and be like, oh, shit, why did I do that? I wish I still had a penis. Like, uh-uh. Yeah, speaking of which, yeah, there have been people who have regretted the surgery. And once you get it done, like, reversing it, yeah, that that's not going to happen. There are some surgeries they can do to an extent, but you're never going to get back what you had. Like... Like, for one thing, my testicles are gone. So, that those I'm never getting back. And they're never going to be able to replicate my penis the way it was. Just not going to happen. So, you need to be absolutely certain that this is something that you need. Yes, need. Not just want. This isn't something you just want to do on a whim. Oh, no. This is a very serious surgery that takes months, months of healing, it's a, a very, I mean, it's an eight-hour fucking surgery. <clears throat> I mean, they're rearranging your, your fucking genitalia like it's no joke. And, you know, the whole process of transition is something that you really need to take seriously. This isn't something you just do on a fucking whim because you think it would be cool. Like, no. If you don't have dysphoria, like if you're perfectly fine in your body and you don't feel the need to, like, become the opposite sex, don't fucking do it! <laughs> you know? <sighs> but, yeah, I'm, I'm super, super happy with the results. I mean, it's just, it's so nice to just be able to live my life like any other woman. And Brands, <clears throat> you know, I'm just here to live my life like a woman, you know? I mean, I'm pretty open about being trans online, but in the real world, I'm just another woman, you know? And that's kind of the fucking point. The point is just to fucking transition and move on with my life, <clears throat> you know? And I'm really glad that I've been able to do that. <clears throat> and so... <clears throat> And, <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. And I'm, I'm looking into getting some other surgeries, facial feminization surgery and possibly breast implants. And for those, I need to get my weight back down and everything. So, but even, but honestly, even without those other surgeries, I would be fine. Honestly, like if I was not able to get those other surgeries, I would still be okay. I mean, I'm looking to get those surgeries because Kaiser will pay for them. And if, if, if getting, you know, facial feminization surgery and breast implants increases my self-esteem and makes me feel better about myself, then yeah. But as far as my dysphoria, my dysphoria is, for the most part, gone. The only time I, I get any dysphoria at all is, like, if I say if my estrogen levels get a little too low. But otherwise... I'm fine. And it's just, it's so great to actually feel like my body is mine now. Like not feeling out of place in your own body is such a wonderful feeling. <clears throat> and I am very, very grateful that I was able to get this surgery. And honestly, like, 
what I what I was able to get, everybody should be able to get. I mean, this is a legit fucking condition, and this is, you know, an appropriate surgery, you know. So as long as somebody has been properly diagnosed, yes, I am against self-ID, and I am in favor of, you know, getting a proper diagnosis. You know, the way Kaiser does it is you would you um you go to, I went to their clinic in Oakland and they and they do a number of these on the same day so there were other folks there to get approved and so you talk to a psychologist uh the social worker a nurse and the surgeon the psychologist approves the um the the mental health aspects of it like are you a good candidate? Do you have dysphoria? Are you really trans, basically? The social worker is there to determine whether you're going to have an appropriate aftercare situation. Like, are you going to have somebody to help take care of you? I don't remember what the nurse was there for. And then the surgeon, he approves you from a medical standpoint. Are you medically healthy enough to do this? And then once you've seen all four of these folks individually, then they all get together and they confer to see if you're a good candidate for the surgery, and I was. And I think that's that's a great way of doing it. Oh, and and oh, and I think it was you had to be on, on hormones for like a couple of years before doing the surgery, which I think is a good idea. Like you definitely need to spend some time living your life as a woman before you decide to radically alter your genitalia, you know? Because if you can't handle living as a woman, you probably shouldn't get the surgery. But yeah, I think this video might have gone on long enough, so I think I'll go ahead and wrap it up. And just to reiterate, I will be posting photos that I took at the hospital and everything. I'll be posting those on Instagram, and I may also be posting some uh, some little videos from that I shot, like before going to the hospital and while I was there and everything. So, so yeah, if you enjoyed this video, please, you know, please share it and like and subscribe and all that stuff. And please follow me on all my social media stuff that'll be down below. And I would greatly appreciate it if you could become a patron and support me on Patreon because I am poor and it would be really nice if I could actually you know, at least make a little bit of money doing this, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily expect to like make a full time income off of this. But hey, if I can make a little something off of this, that would be awesome. So thank you. And I will see you all later. Bye.